already had our prayer and so we'll continue. Um, you know, sometimes people come to the first meeting like we just finished and they don't come to the other meetings where I share how it works and especially often people don't stay for the last two which then helps them to see how to have victory and how and what got what happens if they fall and and then they say well I teach a gospel that is impossible to live and it's not true if we understand all the steps and we know just how Jesus uh, works with us and uh, treats us even if we fall all right and so let's go into these steps that um, God has given us in his word because he says in Philippians through Paul Philippians 2 12 and 13 we read work out your own salvation with fear and trembling what is the next part for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure and very often people are trying to work out their own salvation trying to overcome trying to have victory without allowing God to work in them and it's no use it, it'll fail but once we learn how to submit to God and let him work in us then it's possible to overcome and so it's very important we understand both parts God has a part man has a part if you will read down God's part all of God's part has to do with working in us doing something within us to help us to come to this victory all our part has to do with working out what God has already worked in but it goes step by step if we do not cooperate with God as he's trying to do his work he cannot go any further and he will just stay knocking at the door pleading and and uh, trying to get our attention so that we can cooperate with him and so number one he will draw us the Bible says in um, John 12 32 I if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me and so even before you are born God is trying to help your parents to be drawn to him so that you could be brought up in a Christian home and you think of John the Baptist his parents were fully committed filled with the Holy Spirit and John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from the mother's womb and he walked with the Lord he had a tremendous advantage over children who are born from parents who are not walking with the Lord but every mother could have that privilege but even if you were not born in that kind of home God is drawing wanting you to come into full relationship with him and as we take time to listen to God and get to know him through the word then he can even draw us um, better so that we can truly come to him we read in uh, Matthew 121 
First of all, John 3, 14 through 17. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so God is in the business of saving people, not condemning them. He wants to save us. He is doing everything he can to save us if we will only cooperate with him. And so the very first thing is to help people to know God, to know Jesus, to know how much he loves us and how much he really cares. Um, many uh, children have grown up in homes where they have not really been loved and they cannot grasp the fact that the Father in Heaven loves them and that Jesus cares about them. I've talked with many such people and they have a hard time believing and if they can't believe it then God can't really draw them the way he would like to. And so it's very important that we share with people how much God loves us. He wants to save us. He's not there to keep us out of heaven. He's there to draw us into heaven. Amen. But he cannot save us in sin. It's just as simple as that. He has to save us from sin. The Bible says it very plainly. Matthew 1, 21. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So he didn't come to save us in sin. He came to save us from sin. He came to take away the bitterness, to take away the resentment, to take away the jealousy and the anger and the envy. That's what he came for, to take away sin. In um, One Selected Messages 322, during his 30 years of life on earth, his heart was wrung with inconceivable anguish. The path from the manger to Calvary was shadowed by grief and sorrow. Hating sin with a perfect hatred, he yet gathered to his soul all the sins of the world. What did he do with your sins? He had to gather them into his soul so he could feel the guilt of them and so he could die for them as though they were his own. You know, sometimes young people say, huh, Jesus didn't have many temptations. Look at the world today. Jesus knew all the sins of mankind. Jesus had to gather them all into his soul and still keep himself pure. And he had to know them as if he had done them. As if he had indulged in them. And the pull, when he went into the wilderness, first of all I'll read this, the guilt of every sin pressed its weight upon the divine soul of the world's Redeemer. The evil thoughts, the evil words, the evil deeds of every son and daughter of Adam called for retribution upon himself, for he had become man's substitute. That's what it meant, a substitute. He had to feel it all. He had to know it all. Though the guilt of sin was not his, his spirit was torn and bruised by the transgressions of men and he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, he was made sin 
that we might be made righteous. Sin was not just counted to him. No, he had to know it. And in the same way, righteousness is not just counted to us. No, we have to experience it. He came to make us righteous, not just call us righteous. It's for real. And he had to feel the sins of the world for real. We read, as soon as Christ entered the wilderness of temptation, the weight of the sins of the world was pressing his soul and his countenance expressed unutterable sorrow. He felt the overwhelming tide of woe that deluged the world. He realized the strength of indulged appetite and of unholy passion which controlled the world. He felt it all, the pull of all those sins so that he could save us. The humanity of Christ reached to the very depths of human wretchedness. That's when he became the sin bearer. Before that, as a child, he had to deal with sin as a child. But when he became the sin bearer, when he entered his ministry, and right from the wilderness on, he had to know what sin had done in, in people's lives. He had to feel the pull of it. In his closing hours while hanging upon the cross, he experienced to the fullest extent what man must experience when striving against sin. To the fullest extent, striving against sin, keeping himself pure. He realized how bad a man may become by yielding to sin. He realized the terrible consequences of the transgression of God's law for the iniquity of the whole world was upon him. He was made sin that we might be made righteous. And so as we learn about Jesus and all that he went through for us, do not resist. It's easy to resist. Especially if you don't know you're in a lost condition. I didn't know I was in a lost condition. And for years the Holy Spirit tried to get through to me, study. God knew if I would only sit down and carefully study, I would realize my lost condition. But I, I was just a good girl. I had never gone out in the world. I, I loved obedience. My parents had no trouble with me. And, and so I took it for granted. I was a Christian. But I was just a good girl. And when I got married and had to deal with a husband and children, it wasn't as easy as it was when I was a young girl. And yeah, then I had resentment and, and some of these problems. But you see, doesn't everybody have those? And so I compared myself with others and I didn't have a big problem. I didn't know I was not on the road to heaven. And so the Holy Spirit tried to get my attention, study, study. But I was so busy working for God. And my husband studies all the time. He's an editor. He's a minister. And so he was into books all the time. And he never came to me and he said, Margaret, do you understand this? Have you experienced the new birth? Do you know what, what it means? No, because he himself didn't know. You see, you can study theology for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and never find the truth. You have to study to find God. You have to study to know how to be a Christian. 
then you will find it. And so when I studied to help my father, well, I discovered it very quickly that I was a lost person. And it wasn't until my father cried for help that I really sat down to study. Then I stopped resisting. And then the Holy Spirit could get through to me. And very quickly he convicted me. Number two, he will convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Well, if I did a little sin, I was convicted. If I cheated on a test, I was convicted. I knew I had to confess. I knew I had to make it right. If I told a little lie to protect myself, I knew I had to make it right. And so I did. But it's not just sin that he convicts us of. Righteousness. Do we have the fruit of the Spirit? And as I was studying, I realized I have no righteousness. All my righteousness is just self-righteousness. And blaming others for my sins of irritation and impatience and anger and, and resentment. I had no righteousness. And then he convicted me. I was not ready for the judgment. And so then I really searched for my own soul, not just for my father. And as I searched, I found answers. That text was in John 16, 8. He will convict us. And as he convicts us, what must we do? Acknowledge our guilt. Blame no one else. Acknowledge your guilt, the Bible says. In um, Jeremiah 3, 12 and 13. Return, faithless Israel, says the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt, that you rebelled against the Lord your God. Stop blaming others and say, I did wrong. When I have a wrong spirit, whose fault is it? No one else but mine. Why should I sin if someone else is sinning? If they are doing wrong, why should I go and help them to do wrong by getting angry with them? You see? We just have to think a little bit of what is happening here. Why should I sin because they are doing wrong? And why should I use Satan's power to correct them instead of God's power? Do you see? One or the other. We are using power. When we get angry, we are allowing Satan's power to control us instead of God's love. And so I acknowledged my sin. I acknowledged I was wrong. And I came to the Lord and I said, Lord, I give up my right to those sins, to have a wrong spirit. God reveals to us our guilt that we may flee to Christ and through him be set free from the bondage of sin. But you see, if we blame others, we'll never be set free. Never. It's impossible because God cannot do it. My father always blamed others. And so, how could God help him? How could he ever be an overcomer? It was utterly impossible. And here he was at the end of his life. And that Sabbath when we were all together and we were talking about these things, 
In the evening, two of my sisters said, let's kneel in a, in a family circle and let's confess to one another where we have wronged each other so that there can be nothing between because they had been deeply studying and they had been brought into deep repentance. They wanted nothing between the soul and the Savior. And so we were kneeling there and one of my sisters looked up at Father hoping he would confess how deeply he had wronged her. He couldn't do it. She didn't say a word, but he knew. Because people know, the guilty know, just what sins to confess, that their hearts may be pure before God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit tells them, the Holy Spirit convicts them. Isn't the Holy Spirit wonderful to do that? Because if he didn't do that, we would keep on excusing our sins. But some people excuse them anyway and keep their guilt. Anyway, um, as my sister looked up at father, he couldn't do it. He jumped up, he ran outside. And I jumped up and ran after him to protect him. Because I remembered from, from childhood that if father had to take the blame, he would threaten to kill himself. And so I ran after him, I caught up with him in the dark, I put my arms around his neck, he was no taller than I, and I held him tight. And I prayed, Lord, what do I tell my father? And the Lord gave me strong words. I said, Dad, the reason you get so tense when all of your children come home for a visit is because you are so afraid we are going to talk about our childhood to one another. He never wanted to leave mother alone with us because we might share some things. And I said, you, are so, you have so deeply wronged your children. The only one you have not wronged is me. He thought for a moment. He said, Margaret, I have wronged you too. Well, yes. Um, I can remember one time when I was very much wronged. I was milking cows and one cow was kicking like everything and I was only about 13 and I was trying to keep that pail of milk from being knocked in the gutter and all of a sudden the cow just lifted her foot and, <laughs> and there the milk went. And my father came with a big rope and he gave it to me and the cow. He was so angry. We couldn't afford to lose that milk, which was true. But what could a little girl do? You see? And the father should have understood I was doing my best. But no, when things went wrong, he went out of control. But, yeah, and when I said this, and he acknowledged I have wronged you too. What was he doing? What was he doing? Acknowledging his guilt. And then he took me into the house, into a, a, a room where the others weren't there, and he just poured out his guilt, even from his youth. He said, Margaret, the guilt is just crushing me. Help me! And I couldn't help him. I didn't know how to lead a sinner to the foot of the cross. I didn't know what to say to him. And I said nothing. And I went home to study, to find out what he needed. Four years later, the Lord sent me back, but in the meantime, he also was deeply studying. And so it all came together. 
Acknowledge your guilt. He had even gone two years before I came back from India. He had gone to a minister and pleaded for rebaptism because the guilt was crushing him. He didn't know what to do with it. And the minister just rebaptized him, and that was it. And Father said the guilt got heavier. Why? Because he hadn't surrendered his heart. No one had taught him what was involved. And he was still excusing his sins. Anyway, it says the guilty know just what sins to confess that their hearts may be pure before God. Those who have not humbled their souls before God in acknowledging their guilt have not yet fulfilled the first condition of acceptance with God. The first condition. Acknowledge your guilt. The only reason we have not remission of sin and remission of sin means the sin is taken away. The only reason we have not remission of sin is that we have not acknowledged to him whom we have wounded by our transgressions, whom we have pierced with our sins, that we are at fault. You see? We blame situations. We blame other people. How can we get rid of sin when we do that? It's impossible. There's no power there. And so this is very important. Acknowledge your guilt that you rebelled against the Lord your God. The confession that is the outpouring of the inmost soul will find its way to the heart of infinite pity. One Selected Messages 326. The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Psalm 34, 18. Come to Christ just as you are and contemplate his love until your heart is broken. If you're not ready to give him your heart today, do that. Come to him just as you are and study to know him until your heart is broken, until you can acknowledge, I am a sinner. I did wrong. If you have not already understood and come to him. When I um, began to understand these things and, and I was ready to go back to my father, I prayed, now Lord, send me back to my father. But I want you to um, have my family call me and have them offer to pay my way from Washington, D.C. to British Columbia, where most of them lived. And I didn't even tell my husband I was praying that, and I just prayed, Lord, I want you to be in charge. I want you to send me when it's time. And open the door for me to go. And so I prepared myself, I made myself a little notebook and wrote down many things that I had discovered and I believed the Lord would work it out. A couple of months later, one of my sisters called and she said, Margaret, help me. What's wrong? My daughter has run away from home, 19 year old girl. Um, she's She's on drugs, she's with a man, I don't know what to do. I said, well, Tom and I, Tom is my husband, Tom and I have just discovered the Lord a few months ago. We feel for the first time we could help a sinner. Would she come and visit us? I don't know where she is, my sister said. I said, never mind, we'll pray. And we'll pray that if we can help her, God will send her. 
In one week, she was there. The fella had left her. She didn't know where to go. She went to mother, and mother said, your auntie would like you to visit. So here she was. But she hadn't come to find Christ. She came for a change of scenery. And when I looked at her and we tried to make a little conversation, I thought, well, Lord, how do you do it? <laughs> how do you help a deliberate, stubborn, willful sinner? I didn't know how. And I prayed, Lord, you're going to have to open the door to her heart. I don't know how. And as I was praying, and we were conversing a little bit, there was a knock at the door. And I went to the door, and there stood a Seventh-day Adventist minister's wife from right next door to us. We had just moved there. We didn't really know her. And she said, uh, Margaret, I sense that you and your husband are finding something real in Christianity. I want it too. Will you share with me? Well, of course. And I invited her in and, and we sat down and I drew some pictures for her similar to this. I didn't have any of this done at that time. It was just at the beginning when I was starting to share. And, and we talked about these things and about the power of the gospel and, and the whole time my niece was in the room and I was not preaching at her I was talking with this lady and we had a wonderful conversation and when the lady left my niece turned to me and she said auntie if there is that much power in the gospel there's hope for me I said why do you say that she said, you know me, you know how stubborn I am. I said, yes, I know. She said, I watched my parents. They didn't have victory. I watched my friends' parents. They didn't have victory. I watched my teachers, and her father was a church school teacher, and all her years of school were in church school. She said, I watched my teachers. They didn't have victory. And so I just decided, if they have tried all those years to have victory, and it's still not there, I might as well give up right now and enjoy the world, and that's what I'm doing. And she said, I love sin. My conscience doesn't even bother me anymore. But if what you are saying is true, then there's hope for me. Can you imagine how I felt? The door was wide open. We had a good conversation, and I looked forward to weeks of sharing with her. The next day, the door was closed. And I did not force it. You know, our young people have been pushed and pushed and pushed to be good, to do what is right. But have we taught them how to come to Christ? So they can have victory, so they can have power. Nobody taught me how to come to Christ. And I didn't teach my children either until I discovered the way. I taught them to be obedient. And if they weren't obedient, they were punished. We had the obedience of law, but we didn't have the obedience of faith. We didn't know how to lift our souls to receive power from above. And so I was sharing all these things with her. But the next day, the door was closed. She went on the street. She got a job at McDonald's. She did her own thing. We were living in Washington, D.C. And we didn't see her very often. She was in a bedroom in our downstairs, and she ate most of her meals at McDonald's, and she was running around. And we kept praying. We kept believing God had sent her. 
Then one day, I was on the phone with uh, a very good friend of mine, a minister's wife. Uh, She had just run off with another minister and had left her husband and her three young sons and I just felt terrible. I had gone to school with both of them and so I pleaded with her to come back. No way. I spoke an hour with her and I didn't realize it that my niece had come into the room and was listening to the conversation. And after I got off the phone, my niece said, Auntie, I sensed your disappointment. Aren't you disappointed with me? I said, Lord, tell me what to say. Here's another open door. I said, no, I'm not disappointed. The Lord has long-range plans for you and I am trusting the Lord. And I was. She heaved a sigh of relief. And she became more open to talk. I was not going to push her. And she felt more free. And uh, we had another good conversation. But the next day she was out on the street again. And about a week later she came in and brought uh, a young man with her and um, she said, Auntie, I would like you to share the gospel with him. And I thought, well, here she's been uh, into sin with him and then she comes and wants me to share the gospel with him. But I did it anyway. I sat down. We had a good talk with him. He was very much into uh, mystical religion. And yeah, it was very difficult to get through to his thinking. But anyway, after he left, I said to her, what are you doing? You led him into sin. You spent the weekend with him. He's a married man. And now you bring him to me? to teach him the gospel. What are you doing? She said, Auntie, I know now that there's enough power for people to be saved. Anyone except me. Hmm. And so I began to pray, Lord, show me what is the problem. Why does she still not feel savable? There are many young people who don't feel savable. My son didn't feel savable because everybody rejected him when he was little. He couldn't learn to read. He, had, he was dyslexic. And they were just teaching by memorizing words instead of teaching the ABCs. And the poor kid could only see two letters at a time and they were backwards. Well, how could he learn to read by memorizing words that he didn't even see? And so he was treated as dumb and stupid and and his teachers rejected him through the years. I, I gradually did my very best to help him get through it but finally when he was when I had discovered this and we were t- talking and someone gave me a book on dyslexia and I said whoa that's his problem no teacher had known it and nowadays yeah they pick it up very quickly but then they didn't and uh, so I went to him and I I gave him a book to read upside down and I said read to me Arlen he started to read and he laughed because mom it's upside down I said it's okay read He started to read. He said, Mom, I can see a whole line at a time. You see, he was reading backwards. A dyslexic person's eyes go the opposite direction and they don't even know what is wrong. And here they're supposed to read this way instead of this way. 
And then I told him what his problem was, and he said, Oh, Mother, everybody thought I was dumb or lazy. The only one who still had faith in me was you. And I thank God I tried. But I was hard on him too. I would get upset and I would be impatient. But I, I did my best to try to help him through school. But, you know, then when I discovered this way and discovered his problem, I gave him Desire of Ages and I said, Arlen, read Desire of Ages. It'll help you. Finally, he decided he would do it. And he said the Lord helped him. It wasn't hard reading. And uh, when he finished, he came to me and he said, Mom, isn't it wonderful that God loves me? You see, until you can believe that God loves you personally, how can you open your soul to give yourself fully to God? You can't. And so it's very important to know Anyway, here was my niece, and I started praying, Lord, show me, why does she still not feel she can be saved? And um, I didn't find the answer. And here was the last day she was with us. She was saying goodbye, and I said, Lord, please show me the answer. And the Lord gave me these words. Um, I said, if you ever want to follow Jesus, don't start by trying to get rid of your sins. Start by sitting at the feet of Jesus. Get to know him. Spend hours with him in the word. And let his spirit work on you. And that's what we read here. Come to Christ just as you are and contemplate his love until your hard heart is broken. Well, she didn't say she would do it. She didn't say she wanted to follow Jesus. Anyway, she went home and we kept praying. Two months later, she phoned. She said, Auntie, I've done what you told me to do for two months. I have been sitting at the feet of Jesus. I have just spent all my hours reading the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And she said, I can hardly believe what the Lord is doing. My whole heart and mind are being drawn to Jesus and I don't even care about sin anymore. Who had done it? God had done it. Why? Why could he not do it before? She didn't know him. She had to get to know him. She had to let him work on her heart so that he could bring her to surrender. He gave her repentance. You see, repentance is a gift from God. You can't work it up in your own heart, but God can do it. And we read here in this same statement, it is the virtue that goes forth from Jesus which strengthens the purposes of the heart to turn away from sin and to cleave to that which is truth. It is Christ's virtue that makes repentance sincere and genuine. And so she had genuine repentance. And her mother saw the change in her, and in a few weeks her mother called and she said, Margaret, what, she, what my daughter has learned, I want to learn too. Will you come west if I pay your way and teach us? I was so excited because now the door was open to go back to my family and to share with them. And then uh, another brother um, called and he said, Margaret, I hear you're coming as far as Walla Walla to share with um, the family there. 
Will you also come to British Columbia if I pay the rest of the way? So two calls and then a third call came. And so I knew I could go to all my family and God was arranging it. And I shared with them what I will share with you the rest of the time that we are here. Um, he will give you repentance. It is a gift from God. And then you can confess and forsake your sins. And when he gives you repentance and he, he, he uh, works in your heart so that you don't want sin anymore like he did with my niece's heart, then it's not hard to give up your sins and to come and confess and make things right. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. The, the sorrow of the wor world worketh death. There are many people who have the sorrow of the world. What is the sorrow of the world? Oh, you feel bad because you hurt someone, but not because it hurt Jesus. Not because you really want to turn away from the sin. But true repentance makes us want to turn away from the sin and give them all to Jesus. We read in Proverbs 28:13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Confess and forsake. This is a big step. Not just confess your sins and forsake them, but give your whole heart to Jesus. This is where full surrender should take place. Because just to give up one or two sins is not enough. He says, give me your heart. I want you. I don't want only your sins. Christ is able to cleanse to the uttermost all who come to him in faith. He will cleanse them from all defilement if they will let him. But if they cling to their sins, they cannot possibly be saved. For Christ's righteousness covers no sin unrepented of. And what is repentance? Saying, Lord, here it is. I'm ready to give it up. Christ never covers sin in us. He takes away the sin. Then he covers us with his righteousness. Take away the filthy garments, put on him white garments, the Bible says. But first of all, he must take away the filthy garments. There are many... This is Desire of Ages, no, Christ's Object Lessons 97. There are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit. They hope in this way to become Christians, but they are beginning in the wrong place. Our first work is with the heart. Our first work. You see, and many people have given up all kinds of sins of the world, but they've never given the heart sins. Never given the heart. My son, give me your heart. This is from Steps to Christ, 43. The whole heart must be yielded to God, or the change can never be wrought in us, by which we are to be restored to his likeness. By nature, we are alienated from God. The Holy Spirit describes our condition in such words. We are dead in trespasses and sins. We are held captive by Satan at his will. You see, we are born in a lost world. Unless we give ourselves to Christ, we are automatically the slaves of Satan. God desires to heal us, to set us free, 
But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to him. The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. You know, it's quite easy to give up this and this and this sin. But what about the self? The warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. So before God can give you a new heart and a new mind, you have to give him the old one. Makes sense, doesn't it? And so we have to come and say, Lord, here I am. Take me as I am. I give all myself to you. I give all my heart sins to you. I give up all right to act by my lower nature. That's what it means to die to self. To give up your right to act by Satan's ways. The Bible puts it this way. Put off, this is Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness it's a new creation how long does it take God to create a new heart and a new mind he speaks the word yeah it is supernatural it's a miracle but how long does it take man to come to surrender, to come to repentance. It could take years. It doesn't have to. When, when my niece understood and allowed God to work in her heart, she came willingly. It was supernatural. God was leading her. But if we keep on resisting and don't let the Holy Spirit work with us, then it could take a long time. And when we don't understand what's involved, my mother-in-law didn't understand what was involved. She became an Adventist when my husband was about 11. But she never understood. And then once we understood, we went to her. We tried to share. She couldn't understand. She was already old, and she was in, a, in an old folks' home, and uh, she had gone there when we were in India. And we couldn't seem to make her understand. And then a um, um, Salvation Army person came along, a uh, Salvation Army preacher, and he was visiting all the old people in the nursing home. And he said to her, Have you ever given your heart to Jesus? She thought. She didn't know. And so he said, would you like to do it now? She said, yes. And she was a different person. They called her the miracle woman in the nursing home. She was very different. She had finally surrendered her heart. She started reading her Bible. She started singing hymns. <clears throat> She started doing things. She was 93 at the time. And as soon as we came to visit her, we knew immediately something had happened to her. She was not the same person. And she had experienced the new birth. She lived to be 104. And so it, it doesn't matter how old you are, but you see, you have to come, you have to believe, you have to surrender. And God can bring you to that place if you spend time with him, just as you are. 
Just spend lots of time with him and he will break your heart and he will bring you to repentance. He will bring you to the place where you want to give up self and it won't be too hard. The Bible says, Romans 6, 11, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so we want to come to the foot of the cross. And we'll continue tomorrow. May the Lord bless you as you think on these things and allow him, if you haven't already come to the foot of the cross, allow him to bring you there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you love us so much and you don't give up. You continue to work with each one of us and help each of us to know our condition and to be truly committed to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. International copyright, all rights reserved. Free listing of this message and over 7,000 other presentations by more than 100 speakers on 50 different topics is now available on our American Christian Ministries mobile app for Android and Apple devices and on our secure website or call 800 233 Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help to prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.